Hi, Chris here from Woodman Spirit Channel. I uh, want to do a, a brief uh, but detailed uh, movie on uh, the entire process of hafting an axe. But in this video, I want to go into uh, very specific details about uh, how to do it so you get the best results. Uh, I do appreciate the lots of videos out there right now some of them very good videos uh, and many people use similar similar techniques to me to uh, uh, haft axes but this is what I've learnt in, uh, in probably over 40 years of hafting axes, adzes, hammers uh, any, any variety of hand tools and also uh, I'm a user of an axe so I uh, understand the finer details with regard to uh, what purpose it's intended for and the geometry and the physics of axes too. So the axe I'm going to talk about today is this one which I showed on a previous video. It's, um, it's a Colour Force Brooks three pound head uh, with the three Swedish crowns on so it's uh, generally described as a military army axe extremely good condition as good as new probably never been used <clears throat> traditionally fitted on a uh, a birchwood haft um, and I just want to make a point about birch some people think it's a second rate material um, but in reality having used them and talked to people who's had much more experience in using them than I both in Finland and Sweden and other Scandinavian countries um, birch is actually I, pre I prefer birch to hickory overall uh, one of the key reasons that it's not of course it's not got the same tensile strength or springiness as um, hickory but it does it's lighter it's fairly dense grained if you get the right kind of birch and from the right part of the tree uh, and it's also uh, very good sh shock absorbing qualities uh, true if you over strike it a lot you would probably uh, destroy it much more easily because it is a softer wood uh, but you know good axemanship ship is about avoiding those mistakes my personal experience of uh, using hickory and I've used hickory, ash, elm, uh, uh, mahogany, many different materials to make axe shafts, oak, several kinds of oak. But my experience of hickory is that uh, under certain circumstances which you would find yourself using the axe, uh, you end up getting longitudinal splits uh, you know, down the length of the shaft. And this can even be ca caused at the point of, of uh, rehafting the hacks and putting the wedge in wrong because that's a, a key issue I want to erase here today so I've already decided to remove this haft I mean it's original it'd be nice to keep it this way but the unfortunately it hadn't been hung terribly well uh, and I'm not totally uh, happy with the sh uh, the thickness of the handle down here I'm trying to make this more suitable to my own ergonomics so as you see I've taken the wedge out already so I'm just pulling this off you can see the fitment marks on there I mean, it's never been it has a slight step there which I don't like and as I say this is this is a three pound head um, sometimes referred to as the Colophus Brooks Wormsland pattern um, some people call it a, a a carpenter's axe which in essence it is that shape but most carpenters acts I come across like Husqvarna, Hulk Brooks uh, and I believe Granfus Brooks and Wetterlings are all way, uh, way lighter than this uh, they're all let's just say uh, just short of one pound uh, sorry one pound to less than two pounds I've not come across any three uh, so I mean principally I don't want to I don't want to use this as a carpenter's axe but it would it'd be nice to have that capability. Shorter halves tend to be hung on to 
um, carpen carpentry heads um, because it makes them easier to manipulate. But this one I'll probably also use as a as a, uh, a light chopping large bushcraft kind of axe. Probably use it for squaring logs off because of the the profile we have there, as you can see. It's fairly slim profile with uh, only a very slight convex in on the edge. So because I at the moment I don't have any access to the to the right kind or quality of birch, uh, I have ended up using uh, hickory, uh, and I've used quite a piece of uh, a hickory sh shaft that's not got a great deal of grain configuration in it. As you see, it's quite pale, uh, but it has a very, very good. I can quite see it there. You know the, you know what people prefer as longitudinal. Uh, fine grain pattern front to back. I mean again there are arguments about this some people say that you know that's some kind of false theory in terms of uh, axes. Some people say that having in fact having uh, uh, crossways grain enables the axe shaft to have more springiness which I can understand I'm not going to get into a, a big debate about that because this is principally about this rehafting of this axe. So this was a, a shop bought, not terribly expensive axe handle. I think I paid, I don't know, well too much, but it was probably about 20 bucks for this. 20, started 28 inches, I'll probably finish it with about 26, 27. Because I think 28 is probably a little bit long for what I want. Um, but what I have done is I've reworked the shape of this so it's very ergonomic to my hand. I've left a swell on the end because that's always a good thing in cold weather or if you're wearing gloves. Uh, that's one of, one of the things I wasn't too keen about on the other one. That uh, When you get tired for tea your hands get wet or, or icy the you know losing grip of a vigorously swung three pound axe is uh, um, you know inconvenient at the very least if not highly dangerous uh, and I always try and reduce the uh, to some degree the thickness of the handle that way uh, and I also aim to end up with a fitment where fingertips are, are or almost touching the palms palm of my hand. Uh, I've left it so here so it's the perfect shape for choking up quite close to the head so again I can still get that um, uh, capability of a, what you would expect of a carpentry axe. Um, and again, it, there was a, a excessive thickness up here, so I've, I've taken most of it off the back, the hunched back of the axe handle there, and uh, as you can see, it maintains quite a slim grip there. Uh, taken away, spent a lot of time shaping down the uh, the fitment of the axe head. Thankfully, this isn't rusty, so in inside the, well, if you can see, because I'm using artificial light in here, uh, inside you, it's very clean in here, and there's no irregularities, so that makes it easier to fit. Um, first and foremost, what I don't like to do, some people like to make a very loose fit, so you can just pretty much turn the axe upside down, and the head will drop off when they're fitting it. I like it to be a tight push fit and for the last inch or so drive it on with a wooden mallet rather than a hammer because a hammer you will know, split your wooden uh, shaft on the end or if you start hammering on the steel it's very soft here as compared with here so you probably cause some burring which doesn't look good and it's not in my opinion professional way to do it. Um, similarly with the, the kerf in there uh, Trying to turn this so you can see the curve. I'll take the head off because it makes it easier. So yeah, I mean this is, I've run a saw down this and taken it a bit deeper and I want this to go two thirds of the depth of the eye socket. So that means once it's inside the head, um, once it's inside the head, the the kerf. Sorry, give me angles wrong on here. The the uh, the kerf will come 
two thirds of the way from the top down to here. Another little feature I, I do, and I us if I can pull this off now, I've driven it on a bit. Yeah, it's coming off, just bear with me. Is I, uh, I was talking earlier about uh, issues of the hickory shafts I use splitting longitudinally, often where this starts, and I found this by taking old shafts off, is that if you don't get a perfect fitment of your wedge into your uh, kerf, I mean, a lot of people buy shop bought wedges and, and they tend to be a uh, steeper angle than this, that, what happens is as you're driving it in it really starts to force open the kerf and it'll, in mahogany and some other woods it will, it will cause splitting down here, often at first you won't see it until it's used vigorously and then the splits will sp spread down that way. So if you can see, and only tiny holes, but there you can see uh, at the bottom of the curve cut, what I've done is I've drilled a tiny divot in there. And what this actually does, it, it greatly reduces the chance of uh, the shaft splitting. Um, yeah, so that's just one little thing I, I found over the years that works well. Uh, so shaping down the the axe shaft. Uh, since this is a shop bought axe, and really all I've done is mod it to my own use, you know, buy something that's oversized and reduce it to make best fit in the circumstances. I use a, a spoke shave, and this uh, I think came from my father, and probably it was my grandfather's, and maybe even my great grandfather's before that. So these are old uh, wooden modded. Uh, very good quality steel spoke shaves and the, uh, one tip here though you've got to be very careful when you use a, a spoke shave as you draw the, the uh, spoke shave down the wood like there you can see a downward slope always shave that way because if you shave this way what happens is you pull up the grain and you end up ugly looking grooves in there and come with the cause of splinters in your hand or sp splits in the wood but when you get below the the bottom of this dip, you've got to uh, turn it the other way, and you've got to go that way uh, towards the, the bottom. Otherwise, you have the same problem. So always look at the the grain and how uh, the curvature of the handle, uh, you know, has implications for sh shaving down without uh, opening up the grip, splitting the grain. Uh, similarly, on the sides. I mean, the, usually axes are like this, they're fairly flat along the side. So, I mean, there are times you've got to be very careful again, but it's, it's not as much of an issue when you're spoke shaving down here, but you can still pull up the grain, particularly if there's any kind of breakaway grain pattern on axes. There isn't much on, on this one. I mean, it, where it's darker, it could actually lift off if you're not careful uh, with the spoke shave. Uh, another important detail is uh, this has got the fawns foot on I quite like the fawns foot I mean they're not totally necessary but they has a little bit of elegance to the shaft I this was quite squared off at 45 degrees what I've done here is put it on a disc sander and I've just rounded this off and then if you can see there I've used the same uh, disc sander to put uh, probably a quarter of an inch of uh, bevel all the way around. The reason for this is that because I do tight fitments on axe heads, uh, as I'm driving it in, in using a mallet, not a hammer, uh, depending on how good the grain is, I mean, this is actually tight, so it shouldn't be too much of a problem. But if I had something with more open or offset grain on, and I start beating on there, I've known little uh, splits of, um, the shaft material come off and there's, of course there's nothing you can do about that it looks ugly and it shows that your your craftsmanship isn't as good as it should be um, so around the, uh, the the section of the shaft that goes into the eye of the axe uh, I do uh, I use a combination of a wood file or a, a light rasp uh, some coarse belt, old belt off a belt sander um, and also uh, um, which I have here 
this is a, a Mora carving knife. Uh, razor sharp, I have a smaller one than this, uh, in fact if I, if I could have found that I'd probably use a smaller one. This is about 4 inch blade. Razor sharp and that allows you to, as you're fitting the head onto the, head onto the shaft, uh, inevitably get like little dark marks, I mean I've sanded most of them off here but you can probably, yeah you see little dark marks there. So those are, those are the places where it's, it's really tight um, and sometimes you can see the wood pulling up. You know, it puts like a burr as you're driving it on, particularly axes that have these ears on them, right? The, you may know, refer to ears as these, uh, as these sections here. This is quite strange really, you've got a round ear on this side and uh, you've got a pointed ear on this side. It's not being fa filed away here, but it's, this is just how it is. Uh, but you tend to find that these ears, uh, I think this is one's, I think I've taken the burr off this, but there was, um, they tend to uh, close up a little bit so as you're driving on the, on the uh, axe head onto the shaft that will actually bite into the wood so I always file it out. Sometimes uh, on old axes really been beaten a lot, the, these ears get pinched in and uh, I usually use a, a steel wedge or something just to force this out a little bit to make sure that the, the whole, you know, the, the shaft has a clear entry into there. So, um, yeah, so, I'm just trying to think if there's anything, oh yeah, so in, to improve and to provide your final finish, you, use a, you can use a metal scraper because you tend to be left with like little flat, you know, like flat uh, edges when you use a a flat blade on a on a curved shaft. The uh, spoke shift does leave slight. Um, you know, as you as you go around it with your hand, you can feel the the uh, you know almost like hexagon in factor or whatever. So I use the back of a an old uh, butcher knife, which is hard steel. Uh, nice sharp spine on it. And as you draw down with this, it will pull up very very tiny. Uh, shavings of wood and they'll leave it with a, almost a mirror finish so you get a nice smooth shaft. I tend to leave these areas uh, roughly sanded on the you know where your grip is because if, if this gets wet uh, obviously it's better for this side to be a little rougher and similarly other working areas if you're using a, a, choke, a choked up axe you can also leave a bit of roughness on the front. Um, I always try and make the the rear of the um, the shaft uh, more of a semicircular wider profile because if you look at the shape of your, ha your hand you know when it goes into the uh, crotch between your, your thumb and your fingers that makes it very comfortable when you're using it extensively but when you fold your fingers round of course you know the the angle between your fingers there is is narrower so I always make it so that the you know it's more of an egg shape I guess if you cut through and looked at it you, the front of the egg shape on the shaft would be uh, narrower and that's where your fingers go around and the back uh, as you can see is uh, is the broader section of, of the axe shaft so finishing it off with a with an old butcher knife or an old uh, bushcraft knife or whatever is gives you a nice finish um, Oh yeah, of course the wedge. Uh, I like to make my own wedges or, or modify shop bought ones. And bearing in mind the thickness of the kerf, uh, I take all corners off and bevel so that uh, the edges don't break away when I'm driving them in. And it's beveled around here. Uh, it's tri This is trimmed down to be pretty much exactly the right thickness for the, for the uh, for the depth of the uh, kerf in the shaft and again you can see there that you know when I'm this is fully driven in it's going to be about there so that leaves you or you should aim to get at least a quarter of an inch quarter of an inch at the top of your axe shaft protruding from the eye uh, and the reason for this is that you know when you've driven it home hard you can you can carefully trim off the any bit of the wedge that's still protruding above there, you can trim it off 
uh, and uh, but you know the the wedge should be pretty much to the bottom of the of the curve. Um, don't make wedges too thick because, as I said earlier, you know imagine like if you're splitting a log with a wedge, you know they're a fairly steep wedge. As you bang it in, it's designed to force the wood and split it. So that's not what we're looking for. Here. We're looking for this just to. Uh, make a fairly tight fitting shaft, squeeze closely up and close any gaps between itself and the outside. And my fitment, I spend a lot of time fitting. I mean, if I was doing this commercially, I wouldn't make a dime out of it, but uh, as you can see, uh, pretty close. This is a slight gap on the sides, which will easily be taken up by a slim wedge. So you don't have to use a thick wedge. Thick wedges. Uh, in variable climates, you know, like you know, dry and then wet weather, what happen eventually is they'll tend to pop out, and then people start having to uh, say, "Oh well, we should have glued it in, or we should have uh, put steel wedge in to hold it." I always try to avoid that. I never ever glue wedges into uh, the uh, kerf on an axe shaft, uh, just because I don't think it's really necessary if, if your fitmanship is. Is, uh, is good but what I do is when I do treat the uh, axe handle I always start by immersing the uh, the piece that's going to go in the eye of the axe um, in a uh, solution of uh, pine tar and uh, pine tar and uh, I always use bio turpentine to uh, dissolve it and that that allows that that dissolving of the pine tar allows it to really soak in and of course as we know with wood when it gets wet it swells so you know, as soon as I've, I've immersed this in uh, the pine tar I drive it into the uh, eye of the axe uh, before it has time to really swell up and get the wedge knocked down and I dip the wedge in the same solution and I, I beat them down so that you know the wood is impregnated with the mixture I mean that not only helps it stay in place but it also stops over time the ingress of water going into the end of the shaft and drying the wood out so you know there's several benefits from doing it that way um, again gluing you know I'm not you know, I know there's some very well respected axe makers who do glue the wedges in and I guess you could say that's peace of mind but uh, I think the major axe, ma axe uh, certainly Swedish axe manufacturers uh, don't use that technique. In fact, Wetterlings uh, went from just uh, using a wedge, a uh, wooden wedge, with a, a steel wedge. They stopped using the steel wedge, and uh, you know, providing the, uh, the quality assurance processes were uh, kept in line. The, there was never any issue with regard to this. Uh, yeah, so that's um, pretty much it, as much as I can think of, uh, f uh, with regards to reshafting axes. And again, this is modifying um, a hardware store axe handle. Uh, most of the same principles apply. Uh, I have a, a large, and I'll show you, show you if you just bear with me. So yeah, I've, um, this is going to be one of my next projects. This is a, a four pound Austrian, some people call it, uh, or Bavarian pattern forest axe. Uh, quite a beast of an axe. Quite excited to see how this turns out. But of course, rarely will you find a, a, a new shaft in a, in a store that uh, is made in that shape D configuration. It's very much a German Russian <coughs> popularity. But uh, with that one, <coughs> you know, with certain other axes I've done, I have to <coughs> have to use uh have to buy from a local timber store whatever wood I can lay my hands on that's any good to make axes out of. This is a piece of, I think this is, I'm not sure if this is white or red oak, I'm not sure. But uh, basically, it was three times as wide as this, and I got a friend to run it down on his bandsaw. Uh, it's got nice tight graining, 
going that way but this um, this will be one of the well for what for one we'll make a, a shaft for this um, and this is 30, 30 inch length so this is the length I want but uh, with the axe uh, sorry with a sharp hatchet uh, um, and a draw knife which is uh, you know it, for those of you who don't know is it's like a almost like a bigger version of a, a spoke shave uh, I'll take I'll mark it out the shape I want it and this is a key thing you know make your axe shafts to if you're keeping them to, to suit yourself or I mean if they're for uh, resale then maybe that's not such an issue although some people do want something uh, made, made as a custom fit but um, you know the, these are typically fit, uh, fitted with a uh, one longitudinal wooden wedge and two other wedges going uh, wooden wedges going across. Uh, that's you know more of what I've seen anyway on on Russian and German axes. Uh, yeah, so in this case it's going to be oak. Uh, I would have preferred maybe ash. I like ash. Uh, tight grain birch. Uh, birch has to be cut from a certain part of the tree in the old days in Finland they used to uh, take an axe and trim off the bark on one side of the tree leaving a big wound on one side and you've probably seen trees that look like this you know they've got like you can see where they've healed over and the uh, you know instead of the outside being uh, round and, and smooth it, it grows back in like that they would over t leave this for about 15 20 years these trees and then cut them down and you'd find very tight grain to the uh, uh, to the outside to the what I described as the uh, narrow contour of an egg shape uh, and you know the theory was that you want your densest grain to the front front of the axe to prevent over strike damage and so on and so forth whereas you wanted your more open grain pattern at the back which allows some spring in a so I've I've done a physical, physic, uh, uh, a test of physics to establish whether that's true, but it sounds uh, totally feasible. Anyway, so that that's the project for today. Uh, next time you see that, probably in the next few days, I'll do a video on, and uh, you see the finished product, probably all oiled up and sharpened. It doesn't need sharpening much, but uh, as I say, the uh, yeah, I think it's going to be okay. I'll probably just uh, dress the edge up nice and sharp because uh, it's got the original slight convexing on there, which is a good idea with a, a slim bit like this. Okay, well, something different. Uh, thanks again for joining me, and yeah, I appreciate any comment, feedback, personal experiences of hafting axe shafts, and uh, I look forward to seeing you all in the next video. Bye for now. Woodsman Spirit here. Hope everyone's doing okay today. We've had a major change in the weather here. It's uh, currently plus four and snow is melting like crazy after uh, temperatures below minus 30 last week. It's quite incredible. Anyway, so I think this will just be a uh, blip in the winter. I think in the next week or so it's going to come cold again, maybe next 10 days. So uh, this was the axe I was uh, uh, discussing hafting in my uh, earlier video and uh, so I've now have it finished, well finished barring maybe uh, just refining the edge a little bit further. Bearing in mind this is a 1943 Colour Force Brooks axe which uh, was looked almost like it was unissued condition uh, military spec with the uh, three crown stamps on there anyway so it's finished it with about a 26 and a half 27 inch uh, hickory haft which is not the traditional haft which was birch but uh, this is what I have available to me at the moment so as you can see um, I have no steel wedge fitment on there but a very close very close fit into the eye 
uh, wedge driven deeply into the full two thirds depth. Uh, absolutely no. Try and get the camera angle right here. Absolutely no gaps around the uh, entry of the haft into the head of the axe. Yes, yeah, so I'm quite pleased. With it. I'm, I'm also quite pleased with the angle of how it sits on the on the new shaft. It should be a very good cutting angle. It's got a very slight downward downward turn on the. Uh, you can see it against that against the shaft there. It's uh, positioned very well on the shaft, and I've left plenty of extra wood there. Bear in mind I spent a great deal of time sh shaving this axe down. I've left plenty of wood there so that if you want to use this as a carpenter's axe, which I don't necessarily, but may be useful, you, know, you can actually have a good grip and work, you know, work close up on things. Uh, right down to the pommel on the end which is rounded off uh, and beveled quarter inch so that uh, there's no splitting when I drove the shaft in. This time I used uh, raw linseed oil. Uh, I think I've only used it a couple of times in the past because usually I found it remained sticky for a long time but I thought to dissolve it with turpentine uh, probably two thirds turpentine to one third oil quite thin and I found after a couple of hours near a fire it was soaking in so it's had two coats I hopefully I could give it another maybe another couple of coats and I'll just see how weather resistant it is because the boiled linseed of course doesn't provide a permanent finish when using wet conditions and it's advisable every or periodically to uh, you know wipe the wipe the shaft down with uh, an old cloth and uh, apply more warm boiled linseed oil but as I say this is raw uh, more of a permanent finish <clears throat> so yeah I'm just out here today because I uh, found a couple of uh, fallen birch trees that I think are probably dry enough to burn so I'm going to cut these up uh, with my old Johnsrud saw 50cc John Shred and uh, hopefully get it out of the back of the wood pile because the snow is unstable at the moment which means that there is a you know whereas it was dry and powdery and compacted before when you walk on it now you go a couple of paces and you probably drop down a foot or more so not perfect for carrying lengths of firewood out up a hill but uh, I'll just see how I get on and I'll speak to you soon.